Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception and Action podcast. I wanted to make this video today to talk about the two different approaches to skill acquisition, the two different camps that have formed and are going back and forth kind of in the area. If you are here, I'm guessing you know generally what I'm going to talk about. I'm, I'm going to dive into the specifics, of course, but what I'm talking about here are things, uh, you know, on the one hand, the information processing mental model prediction approach to skill acquisition, and on the other hand, the uh, self-organization constraints approach, right? So two very distinct things. What I want to do today is to lay out what I think are the key differences between the two of them, right? And I'm going to address some comments that I commonly hear related to this, this, this dichotomy, this two approaches. And you know, I really believe they are distinct, as you're going to see. And obviously, I, I admittedly have a bias towards one of them that will probably come out in the presentation. But if you don't agree with me, I hope this at least kind of lays the groundwork for if you want to try to combine them in, you know, in a theory or mix them as a coach, it lays the groundwork for kind of what you need to think about. What are the differences? What are we talking about here? Right? So, so I hope that that achieves uh, something in, on the, in that regard. So I mentioned there's some common beliefs I, that I don't agree with that I want to address today. Okay? The first is that this these two approaches are not a true dichotomy, right? They're really not that different. And there's a few different ways I hear this. One of them is that they're only really different in one or two simple ways. If I knock that one way down, then the thing whole thing falls apart. An example of this, I hear is nonlinear versus linear pedagogy. Another one is, well, if I can make an information processing approach that allows for kind of variation and technique, um, not just one ideal technique, then that breaks the whole thing down. Um, I, what I want to show you today is uh, I don't agree with that. There's actually multiple differences between the two that really, it's, to me, it's like planting two trees in different fields, right? They're based on fundamentally different assumptions that the branches grow out in completely different directions. The branches are connected to the roots of the ideas, and they grow in completely different directions. So it's not one simple thing that you, if, if you can address that, then suddenly the dichotomy falls apart, in my opinion. We're just using j different terms for the same thing, right? This is the old wine in new bottles. You know, we've been manipulating conditions in practice like small-sided games for years. Now we're suddenly calling it constraints. Um, I hope, again, to show you that's not the case. The terms we use in, for example, in ecological psychology, although they can be annoying, <laughs> you know, with the complexity, they do have very, very specific meanings, right, that define really important differences between the two. The third point I, I often see in terms of this dichotomy is that people that are arguing, especially on the ecological side, are just putting up straw men, right? There's no coach out there that really believes that there's only one way to do things, one perfect technique. There's no coach out there that believes that skill is all in your head in the form of mental models and approach or theorists out there, right? Again, I'm going to show you that's simply not true. There are still many, many people that follow the traditional approach or very, are very, very strongly in the information processing camp and, and really relegate uh, motor control to really a, a minor, almost a minor subservient role in the whole thing, right? Treating the brain like a computer. All the power comes from the processing, okay? The th next thing I want to address is this idea of integration, right? There's a real push out there. I know a lot of people are like the idea of trying to integrate these series. And I, I understand that, right? There's not many things in the world that fall into true dichotomies in life, right? So trying to integrate this, you know, there are, you know, there is some kind of sense to it. It pushes to it. Um, and the idea is a lot of people are pushing that is if we integrate it, it will be more powerful and give the best account the word you often hear is parsimonious, right? It, it, it gives a simpler, clearer explanation. Um, and it accounts for the fact that it depends, right? The big word of people, phrase people like to throw around. Well, I'm hopefully going to convince you again, I don't believe this, right? Integration is not a route to simplicity here um, at all. Um, even if you could integrate them, uh, which I, I don't think is possible, I don't think it gives a cleaner story at all, Okay. Then the last two things that are important ones, I think, if, you, if you're just a coach and you really don't care about the theoretical development, 
a common thing I hear is that it doesn't really matter which side I go with. They both have the same exact implications for how I should coach. For example, I should be adding variability to practice. Okay. Well, that's true with some things like variability. Um, the, there are some important differences. Okay. In particular, I'm going to show you, yes, both say you should add variability to practice, but they make very strong differences in how you should add it and when you should add it, right? So they do have important differences for coaches. The other thing is a lot of people are hesitant to pick a side here because I don't want to limit my coaching. I want to keep a full toolbox, whatever phrase you want to use, right? I want to be use everything available to me. I don't care. Picking a side here and following a certain coach does not rule out a ton of methods, right? You, almost every method you can think of you can use both ways, either way, okay? So it, that's a, a misconception, right? Uh, taking a, picking a side and following a particular approach does not dramatically reduce the size of your coaching toolbox, right? I think that's really important. Okay, let's, let's dive in, right? So here are the two approaches and what I'm gonna talk about. So on the left-hand side, I'm gonna call IP the information processing approach. On the right side, the ecological approach, okay? And these are the core things I'm going to, I want to address, right? So the nature of perception, whether it's indirect or direct, the nature of action control, whether it's internal model-based predictive or prospective online, um, how the flow of both execution and acquisi acquisition happens. Is it linear if going in one direction or non-linear bi-directional? Um, how we should be coaching. Is there one kind of general ID, ideal technique that we should be prescribing? versus there's multiple different ways we have to perform a skill because the environment's always changing and we should let the athlete self-organize. Then I want to talk about the purpose of variability, right? Is it for adjustability or adaptability? I'll show that. Then I want to talk about where does expertise lie, right? Is expertise inside our head? Is it based on our knowledge about our understanding of the situations? Or is it based on our relationship we establish with the environment, what Gibson called knowledge of. And then finally, for training purposes, you know, does this kind of flow? So what I hope to show you is all these things flow one from the other, right? If you assume indirect perception, then you need predictive control, then you need, right, it goes one from the other. And the bottom one is talks about a training imp implication of, is it okay to modularize, you know, take these things like decision-making, and about perception or movement execution and put them into modules, separate them, decompose them, train them on their own, and then put them back in, right? The two approaches make very, very different uh, implications about those two things, okay? So let's, let's dive in here. So the most fundamental assumption where this all starts, the roots of the tree for me, is what you believe the nature of perception is, right? In the information processing approach, the key assumption is that the information provided from our environment that is picked up by our senses, our eyes, our ears, our, our touch, so on, is not sufficient to control our action, okay? It's not enough information there. That is why in the information processing approach, which you know, I designate IP up there, we talk about cues, right? Cues are clues, they're hints, right? When we give an athlete a cue about how to move, not all the information they need is there. It's just a little tip. This is where you might find it, right? So information we get from, things we get in from our environment are cues. They're suggestions about what might be going on, hints. We must supplement this, right? It's not enough in the information processing view. We need to interpret it. We need to add other stuff to it. So what's coming in from our eyes, we have to add our memory, our past experiences. Um, we need to process it in some way, right? And on the right there, I've shown uh, an, an example of a very, very well-developed information processing model, Gary Klein's a recognition prime decision-making model, right? You can see the tie top is, is, is information coming in, the black experience and changing situation. We have all this processing going on, right? Expectancies, sim mental simulations, decisions, you know, rules. And then very at the bottom, we, we act, right? So, um, so all the action, we, we need all this because perception information, the, inf the information coming from our senses is not good enough, right? It's impoverished, it's weak, right? We're that's what illusions show, right? 
We're constantly fooled. Um, this is why in traditional uh, textbooks and traditional cor courses, we call it sensation and perception, right? They're different processes. Sensation is the picking up the information from your environment. Perception is interpreting it, right? Figuring out what it means, right? Those two in the information processing view, those are different things, right? They're not happening the same. Okay, so that's the key assumption. The in ecological approach, E, the assumption is completely different, right? It, there's no middle ground here. Like the, the tree is in a different field. The information provided by our environment that we pick up with our senses is sufficient, right? There's enough there. We don't need anything else, right? And the classic example we use in ecological psychology is tau, right? We can tell when an object will hit us based on information from it, the object itself. We don't need to compute anything. We don't need to know about its history. We don't even know, need to know what it is, right? So in the ecological approach, what we're picking up from our environment is specifying information. Information tells you what you need. Specifying, it tells me what I need to act. It tells me how long I have left before the object's going to get there. It's not a cue. I don't need to figure out, mm, maybe I'd interpret. It tells me exactly what I need. The object's going to be there in two seconds, right? So information, not cues. Um, any kind of interpretation, processing, um, pulling in past experiences, all that kind of stuff, expectancies, it's not necessary, right? The information gives me everything I need to act, okay? That's the fundamental assumption of ecological psychology. It's Gibson's idea of direct perception, right? So in this view, sensation and perception are one and the same thing, right? The act of perception, perceiving is the act of sensing, right? Picking up the tuning into certain information sources that we need for our, to control our actions is perception, right? We don't need to do anything else. They're the same thing, okay? So as I said, this is the roots of the tree, direct versus indirect perception that everything else is going to grow from and differ, right? As you'll, uh, hopefully you'll see. So the next assumption is the nature of action control, okay? How we actually take this either cues or information to control our actions, right? So in the information processing view, we're starting with weak, inform weak information, with cues that don't really tell us everything we need, right? So we have to make an educated guess about things, right? When a ball's coming at us, we don't know exactly where it's going. We don't know when it's gonna get there. We have to make a guess, right? And this guess is a prediction, right? We're predicting the future location of the ball, okay? Where the ball is gonna be and when it will be there. And we do this based on an internal model, a model in our head that takes in a bunch of different information sources like the Klein model I showed, takes in cues from the environment, takes in memories, takes in all the things, and computes. It computes the future prediction of the ball. Okay? We can also use situational probabilities. My opponent likes to serve long on this score. Okay? The opponent's kinematics, their body language, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we're putting all of this in in, the, in our internal model to predict, right? We need to kind of make an educated guess about what's going to happen because the information is not good enough, okay? Here's an example of this, and in, in, in this is a post that I made on, on my website recently. If you want to, there's the link if you want to go there, <clears throat> where I was looking at probably a video most people have seen of Ronaldo heading and making soccer plays in the dark, right? So there were crossing a ball to him and he kicked it in the goal, headed it, and so on. <clears throat> if you listen to the way the commentators talk about what he's doing, they're exactly talking about the information processing approach. There's some quotes there. He will use advanced cues to tell where the ball is going to go. He's going to predict, right? He has to predict where the ball is going to go. By 500 millisecond, Ronaldo's subconscious has interpreted the kicker's body language, interpreted, right, processing, worked out what direction the ball is going to go. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, processing, calculated its speed and projection, internal model processing. And then uh, the final part, which I'll get to in a second, the way that this prediction is commonly thought to be used is by programming a movement to get to the ball. Okay. And the last one, of course, really sums this up well. It's almost as if he's doing math in his head, right? He's doing uh, computations, processing, right? That's the idea, to get to the ball. 
Um, so in the information processing approach, the assumptions about how we control actions is we use all these things to make a prediction by pro from our model, and we, then we use it to parameterize a stored motor program. So we have a motor program for heading. We use this information to process the, the, you know, how, the speed, the forces we need to apply, how much we need to bend our body, and so on. And this leads to a what is typically thought is an open loop ballistic um, action. So once we start our movement, because it's pre-programmed, we're not going to adjust it anymore by by taking in information. Right? We're just going to let it run. There are some people that argue, well, I, I could just have a, mo a, a programmed mo information processing model, predictive model that I just keep updating right over and over, and then I that allows me to adjust. Um, I'm not going to get into here, but that kind of loses logic, right? W why would you want to keep uh, predicting if you keep getting information, right? Uh, you can get information that you have in any moment, right? That's silly, right? The example I gave online the other day is if I told you who, how everybody in the United States was going to vote, would you have to predict the outcome of the election, right? You're not making a prediction there. You have information, right? They're completely different things. Right, <clears throat> and this is just a model I have from a recent paper I have coming out. That, well, I'm going to go into this for baseball batting, how this kind of model, predictive model, and programming a motor program works. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, so the, so that's the information processing view. In the ecological approach to action control, right? There's no need for this processing or predicting, right? The information ha in the environment has everything we need, right, to control our actions. All we need to do is uh, pick it up, folk, what's called educating our attention to it. Then we need to establish some relationship between how we're moving and the information coming in in an online manner. Okay, we're going to adjust it online, right? So I can ex explain Ronaldo's heading in the same way, in a very different way, by using what's called information movement coupling or control law. And this is one uh, developed by Gilles Montan and colleagues, right? So we have the ball coming to us. The ball has an angle. That's information. The ball has a time to contact. That's information from the, the environment. We basically control our acceleration towards the ball, the Y double dot there, by coupling it to this information using these control laws. And I'm not going to go, if you want to read about them in detail, go to this post here. But so the idea is here is if, if um, we, this control law starts to break, we speed up or slow down, right? So we're, we adjust our movement, but to keep this relationship true, this control law true. At no time are we ever predicting where the ball is going to be, right? All we're doing is re continuously adjusting our movement to maintain this relationship. That's how control action is controlled in the ecological approach. And this is called right? This is called perspective control, okay? So perspective control means that you're controlling online, you're continuously adjusting, okay? Um, and that you're using, doing it by uh, uh, attaching your movement using a control law that specifies what's called the, well, I love this term, the current future, right? So in that example I gave, that information is telling you, if I keep moving in the same way, Will I get to the ball? It's telling me about what, how the, my current behavior relates to my future goal, right? And all I have to do is keep those together and I will achieve my action without predicting, okay? Important point, again, I'm not going to get into here where you'll see it in my, my paper I have coming out. Um, perspective control can also explain brief periods of open loop behavior where you don't adjust online, right? So when the lights go out on Ronaldo, Right? So if, if you want to see an example of that, go to the, the blog post. But the key, key idea here is we're not processing anything, we're not predicting anything, we're not programming anything. We're just using information to maintain some relationship between how we're acting and the information coming in. That's the very simply what it is. So those are some of the, the kind of the key basics, right? Now let's go to kind of some of the how if we take a step from there, what do these things apply? Okay, one implication is that in the information processing view, right, we tend to talk about skill acquisition as being unidirectional linear progression. Okay, 
And this is the classic Fitz and Posner model, where you start with a very cognitive stage, where you're using declarative knowledge and steps and working memory and attention, and then you're moving to the right to automaticity, right, where you have low cognitive resources. So skill is going in one direction, right? You're going through characterizing and using, your, your model is getting more and more efficient, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. We're going to pull in concepts like chunking and faster memory retrieval and, and, you know, things like that, right? So our model is getting more efficient as we move on, less cognitive resources. There's also a, a linearity and unidirectionality within the actual action control itself, within the processing, right? This is a really old figure I pulled out, but almost every information processing model you'll see will be of this type, right? Information is, comes in as sensed and perceived. It's processed. We make a decision, then we act, right? That's how thing flows, right? We get information coming back around here through feedback. But the key point I want to make here is in information processing models, decisions and actions are the outcomes, right? You, pro you take an information process, then you basically press a button. This is my decision, this is how I act. They are, the word I like to use is subservient, right? They're not involved in any way, right? Deciding, you know, the, the way that information is processed and picked up does not depend on our, our action capability at all, our actions at all. It's very disembodied, right, if you want to use that word. So action is not involved in that process. Right? And you decide after you process and you use your internal model. Right? And that was shown in that Klein model, right? the one I showed at the start. Right? He had all this flow going on, all this process is in the little box at the bottom, implement action. Right? So all this amazing process, then you just press a button to act, right? initiate the motor program. Right? So it very one direction right? Not and very linear. Okay? In the ecological approach, the argument is that learning is very nonlinear, right? It goes through huge peaks and valleys and jumps, right? And we, you'll hear, hear the term nonlinear pedagogy sometimes to describe this. Be this is because people are exploring and adapting, right? And they're causing big uh, bifurcation is the term you know, where you jump to a diff completely different coordination uh, solution. And this is kind, kind of captures this, not completely, but this is a, a, a model of uh, skill periodization I've talked about by Audi and colleagues on the podcast a few times. You could see there's these jumps, right, in learning. There's not one continuous flow. There's also the idea that you may go back to an earlier stage of coordination at some point, so it's bi-directional, right? There also is not this linear unidirectional flow in the execution of action either. It doesn't, in, in the ecological approach, we'd never draw boxes, perception, uh, in processing, decision, action, right, with arrows, right? That the, the doesn't work that way. In, in ecological approach, it's believed these things are inherently coupled, right? One doesn't cause the other. You know, a fancy term given here is circular causality, but I'm not going to go into too much. But the idea is that we they go, it works in both directions at the same time. We perceive to act and we act to perceive. Um, decisions emerge from the ongoing control of action, right? They don't, they're not the product of processing, right? And for all of this, perception, decision-making, the body action is taken into account. It's embodied, right? We perceive relative to our action capabilities. That's Gibson's concept of affordances, right? We perceive not abstract physical parameters. We perceive opportunities for action, right? So in the ecological ap approach, it's very nonlinear and there's no unidirectional flow in either skill acquisition or in the processing, in what's going on to produce the actual action. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is, is kind of the nature of skill and the basic kind of foundation for coaching, right? In the information processing approach, and, and you know, again, I'm going to get to the straw man thing in a second, it's generally we, the traditional view is that there's one general correct technique, right? That doesn't mean it's exactly the same, but there's a basic form to the movement that has several invariant features, right? The idea is here, if you're going to write a computer program, you have to have some structure to it, right? It can't be completely random, right? It has to have some structure to it. And the most well-developed model, and I give them a lot of credit for most information processing models don't, 
take into account the act control of action nearly as much as Schmidt did, but his generalized motor program idea is the idea that we have one representation for each skill, we have one representation of the basic technique, the correct technique, the generalized motor program, which, ha which has some invariant features. Okay, The way that we uh, use this in different situations is by uh, parameterizing it. We we the parameters are variable, the forces, the direction, the timing, and so on. Right? So the basic idea here is there's one basic correct technique, right? That has some variability within it, but there's one foundational technique. Okay? That's the idea of the information processing approach. And you know, here's an example I pulled from a general motorized program for baseball batting, right? I pulled this off a, a you know website. The so the idea is that pitching in baseball has these 13 invariant features, right? These different um, things that you have to have to be a good pitcher, right? And if I clicked on the links of all of them, within all of these are a bunch of technical specifications of what you need to do, the correct technique. Left shoot, you know, what arm angle you should have, what position. And I want you to notice, this is an important difference that really Franz Bosch is, emphasizes, that in the information processing approach, in the traditional approach, the key features, the key invariants are almost always postural. You need to have this body be in this posture, at this angle. Your knees be above your toes, so on. Right? They refer to hitting certain body postures along the way during the movement. Okay. Um, here's an <coughs> exam, example of a conclusion from a baseball pitching study. Um, where they looked at the relationship between various kinematic parameters and accuracy in pitching. And if you read this, the conclusion is making kind of this, this assumption of the information processing approach. The key to being good performance is to be able to consistently produce these invariant features, right? Consistently have the correct technique, right? That's the basic idea. Um, the, in, within the... Uh, so in the information processing approach, because the skill depends on developing these invariant features, right, the way that we should instruct it is through some type of prescription. Here's how to do it, right? You need the feet above the toes. Either that, either if that's through verbal instruction, cues, some type of demonstration, breaking the skill apart. We need repetition, right? We need you to keep repeating the movement until you get the basic invariant features down, okay? We need correction. If you go away from these invariant features, we need to pull you back towards them, right? We don't want you to, we need to have these invariant features of the motor program. If you move away, we need to pull you back. And within it, there's some room, but overall there's very little room for individuality, right? In, in that description of pitching, it didn't, you didn't see, oh, a short pitcher should do this, one with a long arm should do that, right? It's all just one general description of how to pitch correctly, okay? So that's the basic ideas of, of the nature of skill in the information processing, right? This fairly large number of invariant features in the generalized motor program that are parameterized to produce variations, okay? And just so, you know, as I said at the start, one of the things I often hear is that this idea of the perfect technique or one correct technique that you need to prescribe is a straw man. Well, this, this is a, something I pulled off a website, uh, you know, this published in 2019, right? For kids to attain a certain level of skill, right, um, they must practice correctly. Practice, perfect practice makes perfect. If you're practicing something the wrong way, you're just going to reinforce the improper way of performing a skill. Coaches must be demanding of their players they perform the drills and skills in a precise way, right? If that's not prescription and one correct technique, I don't know, know what is, right? I'm not saying that all coaches are doing this, but I am, this traditional view that there's one way to do things is not a straw man, right? It's out there. It's still predominant, right? It's still very, very common, right? And almost every coach I talk to in a bunch of domains say, yeah, yeah, that, that's still the way it's done, right? So uh, that's uh, something I wanted to point out. The turning to the ecological view of the nature of skill, right? Obviously, in the in ecological approach, there's no one correct technique. Um, our environment, both internally and externally, is always changing. So even if we could produce the same movement, it wouldn't work <laughs> all the time, right? So we need to develop a set of movement solutions of control laws 
that are optimal for our own individual constraints. And we need to do this through a process of exploration and self-organization. So we're not developing this core set of invariant features of a generalized motor program first, right? When that's not the goal of what we're trying to achieve in skill, right? And this is commonly described, most people know this as the, you know, Newell's constraints model, right? So skill emerges through an interaction of task, environmental, and organismic constraints, right? And so this is through this emergence process, the self-organization process. One point I want to make here while I have this up is a, a common misunderstanding, right? Newell's constraints model is a general model that's proposed to explain all skill, right? It explains development in kids too. So a Newell's constraint model can actually explain prescriptive instruction, right? Traditional coaching, because prescriptive instruction is a task constraint, right? When I tell you how to do something, I'm imposing a task constraint that's going to cause your behavior to emerge in a certain way, right? That's Newell's constraints model. That is very different from the constraints-led approach, which is a coaching method, an instructional method, used in a certain way to promote a certain type of learning through exploration and self-organization, right? So those two are not the same thing, right? That's really important to emphasize. Okay, so however, right, it's important to point out, although there's the self-organization going on and, and, and things uh, we're exploring, there will be still some invariant features. And this, this is a point where I can see why people have trouble with the dichotomy. Because it, it is, we're talking about a matter of degree here in, term, in some senses, but the mechanisms are actually very different and have implications. So due to the nature of our coordination pattern, right, um, we'll tend to have, for almost all performers, there will emerge certain invariant features for every skill, right? When we run, there's gonna be certain relative phase patterns, right? These are points of stability in movement, right? And sometimes we call them attractors, right? Um, so there's gonna be these invariant features. Like I always say, if there weren't, then we wouldn't be able to distinguish skills, right? We wouldn't be able to say that's throwing and that's hitting if there weren't some common features, right? The big difference though is, in general, there's gonna be less, right? There's gonna be less, uh, fewer invariant features. We're not gonna have as many, right? Um, this is something I got from uh, Randy Sullivan from Florida Baseball Ranch. Here he has, he calls eight attractors in pitching. Remember back in the other one, I had 13 for the GMP for pitching. Within each of those, if I clicked on it, there's at least two or three or four sometimes uh, other things that you have to have. So there's probably, you know, 40 um, kind of key uh, elements of technique and variant features and technique according to that approach. The other thing you can see, I don't know if people can read this, but Rather than talking about posture, right, there are some about posture in Randy's thing, but most of them are about controlling forces, right, co-contraction, right? So th that leaves much more room for your individual variation and much more room for, you know, variation depending on the situation, depending how fatigued you are, right? So we're controlling forces, not hitting certain postures. You need to control for forces at a certain t way in cer certain times during the movement. Um, and the reason they emerge, the other big difference is why these come out, why e these invariant features exist. In ecological psychology, we can actually predict them, what they will be, because they're stability, right? They're, they're stabilizing the system, they're preventing injury. They're not just due to convention or orthodoxy in, in the, the way, right? That this is the way everybody does it, right? There's actually, we can predict which ones will emerge. And, you know, the bimanual coordination research where people are drumming, you know, has exactly done that, okay? So there are these key differences, even though there's invariant features in both, okay? Um, the other thing, so in terms of coaching, you know, we're establishing this relationship with the environment, this perspective control, this control law, right? So we want to allow for self-organization. We want to allow for repetition without repetition, right? You need to be variable, adjust to the conditions. We want to allow a performer to have opportunities to become a movement problem solver, right? A phrase that I like to use that people get mad at me sometimes is the athlete, not the coach, needs to be correcting the errors, right? And even though errors is a really kind of weird concept, but they need to know how to adjust their performance and do things when it's not working right? They can't rely on the coach all the time to do that. It makes for a very fragile learner. Instead of correction, what we want is destabilization, right? Instead of pulling you towards 
a correct solution, we want to push you away from ones we don't like, ones that are in, inefficient, injury causing, not optimal for you, right? That's where we add a constraint or we add differential learning. And by definition, this is going to be way more individual, higher. There's no one way to do things, right? When we talk about controlling forces, there's different ways to control forces for the individual. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is the purpose of variability, right? Why we add variability to practice. And this is getting into the, some of the coaching implications. So in my view, in information processing view, the, the purpose of adding variability is adjusting, is adjustability. So what we want to do is have you develop the correct technique, right? The keeping, like in golf, keep your head down, keep your knees bent, so on, the invariant features. And adding variability is going to allow you to learn to parameterize it. It's going to allow you to learn to adjust the correct technique to perform under different conditions you're going to face in competition. So we're going to teach you, for example, how to hit a golf ball by standing on flat ground. That's typically what we do. You're going to learn the basic invariant features. Then we're going to teach you how to adjust that basic motor program to hit on a downhill lie. Okay. So what we want in the information processing view is we want repetition with repetition. Right? We want you to keep doing the same movement, the King Tech, despite variation. So we want you to be able to learn how to keep your invariant generalized motor program working by reparameterizing it, despite the fact the world's changing around you. We want you to keep your basic solid technique despite changes in the environment. Okay? So because of this, we, we, should, we, we should add variability later in practice right, later in the skill acquisition process. We want you to learn the fundamentals, the invariant features, the technique, and so on first. Then we want you to learn how to adjust it. It should also be the case, and this is kind of counterintuitive in some way, that the variability should be representative. What I mean by that is we should only add variations in practice that you're going to face in competition, right? Downhill lies, uphill lies, bad lies, you know, um, being fatigued, right? Because what we want to do is learn, teach you how to adjust to those, right? Give you a set of solutions for those, right? How to parameterize, right? And that's what I've kind of shown in this diagram. In the ecological approach, to me, the goal of variability of practice is adaptability, right? What we want to do is encourage you to explore, okay? And this exploration is often going to be out, completely outside the conditions you would face in competition. So you learn to pick up information, and you learn to assemble coordination solutions, control laws. So as Keith David said in the, in the presentation he did with me, we want you to learn to learn to move. So we want you to learn how to make golf shots of a wide range, right? How do I ma make the ball move? How do I adjust? You know, we don't want you to learn to move. Like, here is how you hit a downhill lie. That's learning to move. That's learning one movement solution in one condition. We want you to learn how to problem solve. So the goal here is repetition without repetition. We want to teach you how to repeat a good outcome without repeating the movement because we're adding variability, right? So I call it repetition without repetition because of variation. Um, this means to me that variability in practice should come as early as possible, okay? We want you to explore. We're not trying to get you to learn a fundamental technique and then adjust it. We want to get you to explore right away so you learn a variable adaptable solution. We also don't want you to latch on to what sometimes uh, we're called inefficient attractors or solutions that won't tra transfer, right? If we really reduce the conditions and make it, for example, in baseball, really slow pitches, you can learn strategies and control strategies that won't work when we speed things up. Um, we also, we're often going to use, again, this is counterintuitive, in the ecological approach, we can use conditions and practice that are not at all representative of competition, right? different size weights and clubs and bats, different size balls, different types of balls, different body postures, in pitching, throwing uphill as a pitcher instead of downhill. You're never going to do that in a game. Why would we do that in practice? Because we want you to get, the purpose is exploration, adaptability, being a problem solver, not adjustability, right? We're not trying to get you to adjust your pitching mechanics to learn to throw on a slightly steeper mound, right? That would be an information processing approach. Um, what makes an expert next um, in e information processing expertise is clearly from knowledge about, okay? 
it's based on your understanding of the skill that lies within your internal model. Okay, so having an elaborate internal model with a large knowledge base of previous experiences, expectations, having a efficient processes in your inner model, right? And this is where chunking comes in. So being able to more efficiently pull things out of memory. Uh, having lots of if X, then Y rules, right? So knowing, oh, this situation, I do this, right? Knowledge about, and this is a, a Gibson concept, is the key point here is it's separable from action, right? You can pull it apart from the action control, right? It's in, in your head in the processing of the model. In ecological psychology, right, um, before I get to that, again, the straw man argument, um, do people re believe, really believe that all skill lies within your head, even in sports, in terms of your model? <laughs> well, read these quotes from two very recent papers, right? What distinguishes highly skilled performers from less skilled ones is the structural complexity and accuracy of their mental representations. Accuracy, cor there's a correct way to do it, right? The development of higher order control draw a rich history of conceptual knowledge and memory, right? These are some very big people in the area of skill, right? So it's not a straw man. These ideas are not, uh, you know, I'm not just putting them up so we can knock them down. A lot of people believe them. Um, in the ecological approach, skill all lies in knowledge of, not knowledge about. This is again, Gibson concept. So skill is not in your head, right? It's not in the organism, okay? It's not in the environment. It's the relationship, it's in the relationship between the two, in the control law you establish, okay? And it's in having a control law that's calibrated to your own action capabilities, okay? So this is an image from some of Bill Warren's work on locomotion, and heading, right? So this is a control law without understanding, I don't want to go into this, but the, the intelligence where the real skill is, is in this law, this relationship. It's not in the knowledge in your head, in your memories, in your things you built up, your understanding of the skill. It's in this developing and maintaining and calibrating and picking up the information that allows you to do this control, right? That's where skill lies in the ecological approach. All right, the last kind of thing I wanna talk about is again an impl implication for training, right? That flows from all of this. The first is in terms of modularity and decomposition. In the information processing approach, this is a totally, should be a totally effective way to learn, right? Because this, these processes are linear, right? It goes perception, processing, decision, action. We can pull one of those boxes out, right? They're modules, okay? And we can train them on their own and then put them back in, okay? So we can develop our, in, for example, our internal model independently of action control, right? We can have you go on a whiteboard and explain, if this happens, I would do this. Um, we can train decision-making and anticipation using video, right? And then we could put them all back together, right? We don't need you to act. We don't need to maintain this relationship between you and environment in the training. Um, another example, of course, that I harp on all the time is we don't, we can train out of context, right? Because this information processing model relies on these processes like me working memory, attention, things like that, we can train them completely out of context using generalized training and that put them back in and that you're going to improve your overall skill, right? Obviously, um, another thing we, we, within the information processing approach is if you want to make a skill easier and less complex for a new learner, because of the way skill is believed to work in information processing, one effective way to do that is decomposition. So part training, breaking the skill apart. Hitting off a tee in baseball is learning the technique of the swing, the action, without the perception, without the information, right? Um, video occlusion, temporal occlusion, anticipation shown in the bottom is learning the perception, picking up the opponent's body language without the action, right? So we're breaking them apart. Um, so we can decouple these because they're linear modules, right? We can just plug them back in. Right, that's the, the idea of information processing. And again, there's a blog post I did on this if you wanna see more detail about, about this. Um, in the ecological approach, this pulling apart and decomposing is, would not be effective. It's not consistent with the theory at all, okay? Skill is always in the relationship between the performer and the environment. If you break it, there's no skill, right? You, they're coupled, inseparable processes, okay? And I'm not gonna go into it a lot here. In that post I mentioned, you can see some examples of this. There's evidence that when you do pull, pull things apart, you can create completely different behaviors. For example, people look in different places. 
You also, you know, the ventral versus dorsal stream idea in the brain that use different brain areas, okay? So instead of having modular, separable training, in ecological approach, we want representative learning design. We want coupled with action, perception action coupled always, and specifying information. We need the information that you're actually going to use, right? Because that's why you develop those control laws. And if we want to simplify or make a task less complex for a new learner, we do it by simplification. We, we scale down the task rather than breaking apart, right? So we change the size of equipment. We change the speeds. We change the distances, etc. And a great example we talk, I talked about in, in one of the, the first journal clubs we did on, in, on my website was talking about how effective it's been shown to scale the equipment, for, for example, in tennis for kids using smaller rackets and lower compression balls, right? It's shown to have great benefits. And I'm not going to go into all of that here, but that's what we see. So in sum, for me, these two approaches are built on very fundamentally different assumptions. The most basic being indirect versus direct perception, okay? Hopefully you saw that from that, those roots of the tree, everything flows in, in each approach naturally, that whether you can separate things, the role of prediction, right, well, how variability plays a role, right? They, they, they naturally flow from the basic assumptions, okay? The, the idea that these are just straw men, that no one believes in one correct technique and prescription is simply not true. There's tons of examples of that out there. Um, integrating the two approaches, right? I'm gonna get to that in a second. I don't think it's possible, right? It's based on fundamentally different assumptions. Um, and I'm going to get to the second part of this. It's unnecessary and less parsimony. It's the second. For coaching purposes, right, two things that two points to make. One is they do have very different implications, right? For, for example, of how and when you use variability, the example I showed. But, and these things are often very co conflicting, right? So you, I, you, I don't know how you can sit in the middle and use them both ways at the same time. But importantly, they don't rule out having a big coaching toolbox, right? Being able to use lots of different methods. It's just telling you how to use them that's consistent with the approach, right? So I think that's really important. And in terms of the integration approach, you know, I, I see the, again, I see the pull of breaking down a um, dichotomy and trying to integrate things. But one thing I'll point out is you'll notice that the integration movement, right? People pushing for integration tends to always flow in one direction. It's the people that are most more firmly grounded in the information processing approach that want to try to integrate with the ecological approach, right? Very rarely does it flow in the other direction. Firm believers in ecological psychology trying to in integrate information processing concepts. There are some examples, but it's, it's much less rare. Why, why do you think that's the case, right? One, one possibility is that the ecological approach, we, we're a bunch of just hard-headed zealots uh, that don't really take into account evidence, and some people have made those claims. Um, but there's a lot of smart people on the ecological side, so I, I don't know about that. The, but the, the, what the, the main reason I think it flows in the one direction is the ecological approach, we believe, and in, in we're developing theories and models and evidence to support this, that we don't need the information processing concepts to explain skill, right? Whereas I think information processing sees that there's value in the ecological things like perspective control and, and coupling and things like that and representative design. So I think that's why the push. But So maybe you can integrate this. Maybe there's, for example, perception is direct sometimes and indirect at other times. I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to me. But for me, integrating is going to make a really complicated story when... If ecological approach, as I believe, can explain the whole thing, that's much more simple and parsimonious than trying to add in information processing all on top of it, okay? But anyway, that's my two cents on all of this. As I said, if you don't buy my, sto my story that there are true dichotomy there, then I hope at least it gets you to think about what the differences are and you know, ways that you can use them in different ways as, as you're coaching or in, in developing your thinking. Thank you.